Our natural instinct is to begin a story at its beginning. In history, however, it sometimes is helpful to start not at the beginning, but at the end. On July 24, 1915, eight days after the passing of Ellen G. White, Arthur G. Daniels, General Conference President, addressed 4,000 mourners attending her funeral service in Battle Creek's Dime Tabernacle. Daniels had known and worked with White for nearly 25 years. He was then in his 14th year as General Conference President, and he spoke for a movement that was finally becoming truly a global one. And it is striking that this protege and close colleague of Ellen White, in summarizing her life, chose to stress her commitment to mission, declaring, in the writings of Mrs. White, prominence is given to the responsibilities of the church in both home and foreign mission service. Every member of the body is admonished to be a light in the world, a blessing to those with whom he may associate. All must live the unselfish life of the master for others, and the church in Christian lands must put forth their highest endeavors to evangelize those who are groping in the darkness and superstition of heathen lands. Go to all the world, give to all the world, work for all the world, is the exhortation running through all the writings of Mrs. White. The most important theme in Ellen White's writings is that all church members should widely share the truly good news of our Lord, Savior, and Great High Priest. As Daniel summarized her view, every member of the body is to be a light in the world. All must live the unselfish life of the master for others. However, the prophet's general passion for mission had a particular application because as Daniels observed, Ellen G. White believed that the church in Christian lands must put forth its highest endeavors to evangelize those who are groping in darkness and superstition. And this was not just a theoretical concern, for as Daniels went on to remind his listeners, after traveling extensively through the United States from 1846 to 1885, Ellen White visited Europe, where she devoted two years to the work there, which was then in a formative period. In 1891, she went to Australia, where she remained nine years, traveling about the colonies and devoting all her energies to the upbuilding of the work. Hence Daniel's conclusion, go to all the world, give to all the world, work for all the world, is the exhortation running through all the writings of Mrs. White. Accordingly, though my title is Ellen White and Adventist Mission, I have focused on foreign mission, though I do touch on home mission, as you will see. This comes from a longer paper which attempts to distill from White's vast body of writings her principles for foreign mission. I identify an early phase of her ministry when her enthusiasm for overseas mission helped to move the Seventh-day Adventist Church away from an American focus towards a global vision. Thereafter, I identify in her thought six key missional principles, which you will see on the screen in a moment. Though today, due to time constraints, I will focus on the early phase and the fourth and sixth principles. The six principles are as follows. Foreign mission should be led only by people who have had experience in the mission field. That's the first. And the second, Young people have a great role to play and should be entrusted with responsibilities, but they also need appropriate training. Third, financial resources are essential, but should not be concentrated on areas where the work is already strong. Instead, they should be distributed to ensure new territories are entered. Fourth, Adventist mission must go throughout the world, as foretold in Scripture, since otherwise, Christ's return will be delayed and souls eternally lost. Fifth, mission must be Christ-centered and lovingly communicated by missionaries who have been revived by a relationship with Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Finally, as well as being shared with all national, ethnic, and linguistic people groups, the distinctive Adventist message must also reach all religious groups. Seventh-day Adventism is more than a reform movement within Protestant Christianity. All the world's people must hear the everlasting gospel and learn more about the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, as Revelation 14 puts it. 
What we will see today is that Ellen White played a significant part in persuading Seventh-day Adventists to accept responsibility for evangelizing beyond North America, and that by the end of her life and ministry, Ellen White increasingly prioritized mission in countries and regions where Christianity was a minority faith or non-existent. The story of Ellen G. White and the mission of the church is one of how, under the guidance of God, she and we gradually came to see the vital importance of outreach outside North America and especially among what today we would call unreached people groups. Ellen White was instrumental in our transition from North American sect to worldwide movement. But while her Council on Mission was exceptionally important in our history, it also has current relevance. Her admonition that those places where the remnant church is strong must take responsibility for those places where it is weak, in which people may not even have heard about Jesus Christ, much less about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That admonition is still relevant for Adventists in the 21st century as we seek to reach the world. Although it may seem strange to us today, most Seventh-day Adventists initially rejected foreign mission as unnecessary. In 1859, Uriah Smith, the editor of the Review and Herald, wrote in its pages that because our own land is composed of people from almost every nation, it would, he thought, be possible to proclaim to many peoples, nations, and tongues within the confines of North America. James White struggled to broaden church members' horizons, but ruefully observed in 1870 that among those who are ready to help the cause in our own land, to help the cause in Europe does not look so clear. It was more than 11 years after the founding of the General Conference when the denomination's first missionary, John N. Andrews and his children, finally sailed for Europe on September 15, 1874. A few weeks later, Stephen Haskell reflected in the pages of the review, it once required a great stretch of faith to believe this work would find its way to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Although church leaders' initial ideas of this work were altogether too small at first, Haskell continued, they were now making broader and more extensive plans. This dramatic shift was due partly to the trenchant advocacy of James White, partly to pleas for help from several small congregations of Seventh-day Adventists in Europe, which were the fruit of Adventist literature sent from America and efforts by unofficial missionaries. But the sea change in mindset was also partly due to Ellen White. One of Ellen White's earliest and most important divine revelations had weighty implications for foreign missions. At a meeting in Boston on the 18th of November, 1848, Ellen received a vision. On waking, she instructed her husband, James, you must begin to print a little paper and send it out to the people. Let it be small at first, but as the people read, they will send you means with which to print, and it will be a success from the first. This vision is famous among Seventh-day Adventists as the origin of our publishing work. But there was an important addendum to the vision. From this small beginning, she wrote, it was shown to me to be like streams of light that went clear around the world. Implicit in this revelation was that the Seventh-day Sabbath keepers had a global future. Now, for the next 20 years, internal matters absorbed Ellen White's attention and her visions largely dealt with doctrinal and ecclesiological matters. But then she started to receive divine promptings highlighting the need for the third angel's message to be disseminated beyond the shores of North America. She had major visions on this theme in 1871, 1873, 1874, and 1875. In her 1874 vision, Ellen White heard and saw an angelic messenger enjoin an, ad an audience of Adventist leaders you are entertaining two limited ideas of the work for this time. You are trying to plan the work so that you can embrace it in your arms. You must take broader views. Your light must not be put under a bushel or under a bed, but on a candlestick, that it may give light to all that are in the house. And your house is the world. 
In sharing her vision, White concluded in terms that brooked no misunderstanding, the binding claims of the fourth commandment must be presented in clear lines. The message will go in power to all parts of the world, to Europe, to Australia, to the islands of the sea, to all nations, tongues and peoples. Many countries are waiting for the advanced light the Lord has for them. Such unambiguous statements meant there would be no more open resistance to expansion overseas, although private reluctance would linger into the 20th century. Once Seventh-day Adventist missionaries had gone abroad, for the next 40 years until her death, Ellen White repeatedly admonished church leaders and church members to strengthen the denomination's missions overseas. Of course, she wanted the original homeland of North America to be evangelized, along with the new homelands that emerged as a result of Adventist missionary effort in Europe and Australia. But, and here is a vital point, she believed there was a symbiotic relationship between home missionary and foreign missionary work. Consider this profound statement from 1901. The home missionary work will be farther advanced in every way when a more liberal, self-denying, self-sacrificing spirit is manifested for the prosperity of foreign missions. For the prosperity of the homework depends largely under God upon the reflex influence of the evangelical work in countries afar off. Ellen White had a powerful sense of urgency about foreign mission. It was enhanced by and yet it predated her experiences in Europe and Australia because it stemmed from her understanding of eschatology and soteriology and her apprehension that by church members' action or inaction, souls may be saved or damned and the second coming hastened or delayed. In 1892, she wrote to Ellet J. Wagoner, who had just gone as a missionary to England, the Lord's business requires haste. Souls are perishing without a knowledge of the truth. In a 1903 article in the review, she stated, many to whom have been committed the saving truths of the third angel's message fail of realizing that the salvation of souls is dependent upon the consecration and activity of God's church. Meanwhile, in an 1898 tract entitled An Appeal for Missions, she proclaimed, unless your hearts are touched as you see the situation in foreign fields, the last message of mercy to be given to the world will be restricted and the work which God would have done will be left undone. Also in 1898, in Desire of Ages, she eloquently declared, so now, before the coming of the Son of Man, the everlasting gospel is to be preached to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, Revelation 14, 6 and 14. God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world, Acts 17, 31. Christ does not say that all the world will be converted, but that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power, she continued, to hasten our Lord's return. We are not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the day of God. Had the Church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would have before this have been warned and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in great glory. From this followed one of Ellen White's most important missional principles, namely that every Adventist is responsible for reaching the world. She returned to this theme time and again, repeatedly using the language of revelation and presenting total church member involvement in mission as an apocalyptic imperative. In 1902, she affirmed, the heaven appointed purpose of giving the gospel to the world in this generation is the noblest that can appeal to any human being. It opens a field of effort to everyone whose heart Christ has touched. The same year she admonished German-American Adventist leaders, God has qualified his people to enlighten the world. They are to extend his work until it shall encircle the globe. The closing message of the gospel is to be carried to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. In her sermon to the 1903 General Conference session, 
Ellen White enjoined her listeners, our question is to be, what can I do to proclaim the third angel's message? What can I do? She continued, Christ came to this world to give this message to his servant, to give to the churches. It is to be proclaimed to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. How are we to give it? This is a message she saw as important, for later that year she adopted the text for an article in the Review, which she later republished in three American Union papers. In it, she urged readers, as grateful recipients of heaven's blessings, believers are to diffuse the light of truth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. She concluded with a rephrased interrogatory. Let every Seventh-day Adventist ask himself, and we can add, ask herself, what can I do to proclaim the third angel's message? Writing on the education of missionaries, in 1907 she declared, as we draw near to the coming of Christ, more and still more of missionary work will engage our efforts. The message of the renewing power of God's grace will be carried to every country and clime until the truth shall belt the world. Of the number of them that shall be sealed will be those who have come from every nation and kindred and tongue and people. From every country will be gathered men and women who will stand before the throne of God and before the Lamb. Yet again, Ellen White uses the language of Revelation to promote mission. This time, Revelation 7, 3 to 10 in particular, but also 5, chapter 5, verse 3, chapter 15, verses 2 to 4, as well as Revelation 14, 6. Her apocalyptically driven sense of urgency, with its associated recognition that the gospel was for all peoples, meant that Ellen White had no sympathy for those who proposed conforming to racial prejudices, even temporarily, in order to smooth the path of mission. Writing from Australia in 1900, she expressed herself very strongly in terms that were, sadly, to be a standing rebuke to Adventists for much of the 20th century. She wrote, In regard to the question of caste and color, we have the same Heavenly Father and the same Redeemer who loved us and gave Himself for us all without any distinction. We are nearing the close of this earth's history and it does not become any child of God to turn from any soul who loves God or to cease to labor for any soul for whom Christ has died. When the love of Christ is cherished in the heart, no difference will be made because of the color of the skin. Ask yourselves if Christ would make any difference. In assembling his people, would he say, Here, brother, or here, sister, your nationality is not Jewish. You are of a different class. Would he say, Those who are dark-skinned may file into the back seats. Those of a lighter skin may come up to the front seats. In one place, she continued, the proposition was made that a curtain be drawn between the colored people and the white people. I ask, would Jesus do that? This grieves the heart of Christ. The color of the skin is no criterion as to the value of the soul. By the mighty cleaver of truth, we have all been quarried out from the world. God has taken us, all classes, all nations, all languages, all nationalities, and brought us into his workshop to be prepared for his temple. Finally, as her life wore on, Mrs. White increasingly emphasized mission to adherents of non-Christian religions. This, it must be stressed, was not the accepted practice of Seventh-day Adventists at the time. The situation in the 1890s was summed up by William A. Spicer, a missionary in the 1880s and 90s, General Conference Secretary from 1903 to 1922, and then General Conference President until 1930, when he ruefully reflected on how things had been 40 years before. He wrote, We didn't have much of an idea of going to the heathen. We didn't expect to go in any really strong way. We thought, We will get a few along the edges and the Lord will come. But the Lord all the time had in mind this purpose of calling the heathen for His people to come. That Adventist attitudes changed was due in large part to Ellen G. White. In her article for the 1902 Week of Prayer Readings, she affirmed, The whole world is opening to the gospel. Ethiopia is stretching out her hands unto God. 
from Japan and China and India, from the still darkened lands of our own continent, from every quarter of this world of ours, comes the cry of sin-stricken hearts for a knowledge of the God of love. Millions upon millions have never so much as heard of God or of his love revealed in Christ. It is their right to receive this knowledge. They have an equal claim with us in the Saviour's mercy. And it rests with us who have received the knowledge with our children to whom we may impart it to answer their cry. In a testimony published in 1909, she stated, In Africa, in China, in India, there are thousands, yes, millions, who have not heard the message of the truth for this time. They must be warned. The islands of the sea are waiting for a knowledge of God. Ellen White also increasingly emphasized that on church members living in Christian and Protestant countries fell the responsibility for taking the gospel to those who lived in non-Christian lands. In the 1870s and 80s, American Adventist missionaries had gone to Europe and Australia. In the 1890s, by now in her 60s, Sister White increasingly highlighted the mission needs that came from much farther afield. In 1892, in the first edition of Gospel Workers, she wrote, The world needs labor now. Calls are coming in from every direction like the Macedonian cry, Come over and help us. It was an analogy on which she reflected and to which she returned repeatedly. In 1900, in an article in the Australasian Record, she urged believers in Christian lands to be listening for the cry from far off lands, come over and help us. These lands are not so easily reached and perhaps not so ready for the harvest as the fields within our sight, but they must not be neglected. Our watchword is to be onward, ever onward. Our burden for the regions beyond can never be laid down until the whole earth shall be lightened with the glory of the Lord. The importance she attached to this testimony is evident from the fact that it was republished in 1900 and 1903. In another essay published in Testimonies, Volume 6, and soon after adapted for an article for the 1901 week of prayer readings, Ellen White powerfully affirmed, the vineyard includes the whole world and every part of it is to be worked. There should be representatives of present truth in every city and in the remote parts of the earth. The whole earth is to be illuminated with the glory of God's truth. The light is to shine to all lands and all peoples. She concluded this essay with words from the 1900 Record article. Our burden for the regions beyond can never be laid down until the whole earth shall be lightened with the glory of the Lord. In 1907, White stressed that the final message was not just for Christians, declaring in a testimony that was published twice within 12 months and which she reprinted two years before her death. God's work in the earth in these last days is to reflect the light that Christ brought into the world. Men and women in heathen darkness are to be reached. And as her life drew to a close, she returned to the theme of the Macedonian-like cry for assistance when she revised Gospel Workers. One of the last statements she wrote was this, I feel intensely over the needs of foreign countries as they have been presented before me. In all parts of the world, angels of God are opening doors that a little while ago were closed to the message of truth. From India, from Africa, from China, and from many other places is heard the cry, come over and help us. And so, having begun our analysis with the account of Ellen White's publishing vision in 1848, with this testimony, published in the year of her death, 1915, we are nearing the end of our survey of Ellen G. White's missional thought. But we will consider one more testimony before we come to the end and stop. It is a letter Ellen White wrote from Australia to the 1893 General Conference session 
in which she challenged those attending the session to think beyond their relatively comfortable situations and their wants in order that the gospel and the third angel's message be proclaimed across all the world. The reluctance of early American Adventists to see the rest of the world as being their concern had lingered for several decades after the dispatch of J. N. Andrews to Europe. North American Adventists were very active in outreach to immigrants to the United States and Canada from other countries. But many continued to feel little responsibility for sharing the truths they held so precious with people outside North America. Ellen White addressed this parochialism on several occasions, but in particularly stark terms in 1893. But insularity and self-interest are still with us, so Ellen White's challenge to American Adventists in 1893 is, I think, still relevant and salutary for Seventh-day Adventists today. Brethren and sisters in Battle Creek, who have had these precious truths set before you, she wrote, I ask you to think of the many, many souls who need to hear the message of redeeming love. While you have the privilege of receiving from Jesus the living water, will you feast your souls upon the riches of his marvelous love and grace? and yet feel no special burden for those who are still in darkness and error? I ask you to present some tangible proof that you appreciate the love of God. We want to know if you will love your neighbor as yourself. Will you make any personal sacrifice that these saving truths may go to the destitute regions where the people are perishing for the bread of life? If you appreciate the truth, wherein do you earnestly labor that it may be carried to others? Who feels day by day that he belongs to the great co-partnership for honoring Christ by working out the Lord's plan for the redemption of men? Are the people in Battle Creek asleep? Are they paralyzed? The Lord is coming. The scenes of this earth's history are fast closing and our work is not done. All heaven, if I may use the expression, is impatiently waiting for men to cooperate with the divine agencies in working for the salvation of souls. Who will arise and shine because the light has come and the glory of the Lord hath risen upon them? Who have joined themselves to the Lord in holy covenant to become channels for the communication of heaven's light and grace to our world? Ellen White set out powerful principles for foreign mission, but she had one overarching principle and one overriding concern for foreign mission, that it be done! that people whose lives have been transformed by Jesus Christ tell the world about him and the good news of wholeness in this world and hope for the world to come. And that is why, as you will have noticed, I am concluding not with analysis, but with an appeal to each one here to get involved in reaching the world. I do so because it's inconceivable that Ellen White would want any Seventh-day Adventist to talk about mission in only historical or theoretical terms. A hundred years after Ellen White's death, the comment I just quoted is still valid. Our work is not yet done. And I can't help but wonder whether all heaven is still impatiently waiting for men to cooperate with the divine agencies in working for the salvation of souls. Despite dramatic church growth in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, there are billions of people in Asia, the Middle East, North Africa and Western Europe who are captivated by Buddhism, Hinduism and other Asian traditions, by Islam and by secular postmodernism, and who have yet to hear the everlasting gospel. In particular, Japan, China and India countries which, as we heard, weighed heavily on Ellen White's mind in the latter years of her life, these remain huge challenges to Christianity. Might Ellen White's rhetorical question, are the people in Battle Creek asleep, still be posed today to those in the original homeland of the United States and the new heartlands of Adventism in Latin America and Eastern Africa, which receive more missionaries than they send? Are we sleeping? The need that Ellen White wrote about repeatedly and passionately in her lifetime is still with us. For all Seventh-day Adventists everywhere today to be part of the great co-partnership for honoring Christ and to have joined themselves, to have joined ourselves to the Lord in holy covenant to become channels 
for the communication of heaven's light and grace to our world. 